Good morning, everybody. I still need to teach my classes how to do that. That is so cool. Welcome back for our second installment on today's uh, Sacred Trust lectures and, and book signings if you've taken some time to wander around in the, in the visitor center. All kinds of good things going on. We are pleased, at, at, we at the Gettysburg Foundation are definitely pleased to continue this program in cooperation and collaboration with the National Park Service and Gettysburg National Military Park. We try every summer to bring you a new collection of historians, authors, park rangers, licensed battlefield guides, all the people who have that content knowledge about Gettysburg and the Civil War writ large that are, that's so interesting to all of us here. I mean, who, peop, who would, other than this group of, of true Gettysburg nerds and geeks, would be out here on a Sunday morning in 99% humidity and loving every minute of it. I mean, we are special people. And we're going to have a special speaker. Our speaker today is National Park Service seasonal ranger Dan Welch. I'm going to be, I'm willing to bet that some of you have been on his field programs and you know that you're in for a bit of a treat. And especially because he's going to talk about something that's near and dear to many of our hearts, the uh, action of General George Sears Green up on Culp's Hill. Now I'm looking out at this crowd and I'm being a bit reflective myself now. I bet we're all a tad annoyed that invariably after George Sears Green, the oldest general on the field, and he's merely 61. He's a kid. So let's put a new spin and a new perspective on it, and let's see what the youngsters do here at Gettysburg and, and, and deal with this. So Dan, is when he's not being a seasonal ranger here, he is an educator with a public school district in northeastern Ohio. Does a lot with music. Not, he's not all history all the time. He's a music guy, too. So, He's previously served uh, as, uh, with, um, he, he's done all kinds of seasonal ranger programming here. Most importantly, it's kind of new news about Dan, is that he is now the editor of Gettysburg Magazine. And this is a very big deal, because Gettysburg Magazine, <laughs> This is a very big deal because Gettysburg Magazine is published by the University of Nebraska Press, an academic press. It's usually something, that, a situation where you are overburdened with all of us history PhD geeks like me and lots of footnotes and a lot of really burdensome academic jargon and all that sort of thing. But Nebraska had the foresight to see that Gettysburg Magazine had a broader appeal and a slightly different audience, and even though it doesn't fit traditional academia, they said, what the heck, we're going with quality, and so they have. They've given our magazine a home, and now they've given us an editor who is very much in, in touch with the kind of scholarship that's going on here. He's also involved in the uh, Emerging Revolutionary War series and the Emerging Civil War series that an awful lot of us uh, are familiar with, and he's um, the author and co-author and editor of so many different things that we wonder where he has time for his music anymore. I'm sure he's beginning to wonder that himself. George Sears Green, we need the, the man and the moment to come together and Ranger Dan Welch is gonna do that for us. Well, thank you, Carol, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I know I have a challenging task this morning. I have to follow Dr. Brian Steele Wills and get you out of here before lunch. So uh, I, I recognize the task that I have and I'm looking forward to, to greatly accomplishing all of those things in a, a, a due amount of time. But before we get into the program, I do want to take a moment and thank uh, Gettysburg Foundation President Wayne Motts and his assistant Tammy Becker for bringing me on, and also uh, National Park Service Rangers Chris Gwynn, as well as Superintendent Steve Sims for bringing me here this morning to talk to you about a man whose impact on this battle has largely remained obscured throughout most most of the 19th and 20th century, and even to the 21st century, we will see the fall of George Green's notoriety in the historical pages relating to Gettysburg. And it's a program that I hope at the end of, you will agree that his impact on this battle uh, is not only significant, but worth remembering. 
Now on Friday, September 27th, 1907, eight years after George Green's death, his son, George Green Jr., would be on hand here at Gettysburg up on Culp's Hill along with many other uh, former veterans of Green's command and none other than this man pictured here. Perhaps you've heard of him, Major General Daniel E. Sickles, a man who needs even less introduction than myself. <laughs> if you know anything about Dan Sickles, you know he claims credit for winning the battle here at Gettysburg. But in an interesting moment, during his dedicatory remarks to unveil the monument in honor of Green, Sickles will say this, quote, the battle fought here by General Green on the night of July 2nd, 1863 to hold possession of Culp's Hill has a conspicuous place in history. It is memorable not so much for the number of combatants engaged as it is for the skill of the general, the heroic conduct of his troops, and in view of the consequences that would have followed the defeat of the Union forces. Can you imagine Dan Sickles sharing credit with someone else here at Gettysburg? <laughs> saying that they may have had something to do with the victory. So who is George Sears Green? And I think it's important for us to talk a little bit about the man and his experiences, because it seems everything that Green has gone through in his life, all the way up to his 61 years of age here at Gettysburg, has led him to this pivotal moment on the evening of July 2nd, 1863. Green was born in Rhode Island in 1801 to a pretty prominent American family. He was a direct descendant of a pioneer who helped Roger Williams settle the colony of Rhode Island. His ancestors had served as governor, lieutenant governor, U.S. senator, and justice of the Supreme Court, and he is even related to Revolutionary War General Nathaniel Green. He was one of nine children born to his parents, only five of which would survive infancy. Green was educated in Warwick, Rhode Island, before he would go attend Latin school in Providence. And upon graduation from that Latin school, he's all set to go to Brown University. Uh, his father is very industrious. The family is quite well off. His father works as a ship owner and businessman who made his living in trade. But as Green has grown up and gone through his schooling in both uh, Warwick and Providence, uh, the Embargo Act of 1807, will crush the merchant industry, including Green's father's business. Thus, by the time Green is slated to go to Brown University, the financial straits of the family precludes him from being able to do so. So Green, not deterred, decides to go get a job, and he will move to New York City to find a job at a dry good merchant's office. And while working in New York City, uh, he begins to be recognized by one particular person of importance a major by the name of Sylvanus Thayer, who was the superintendent of West Point. And Thayer really got to know Green and liked what he saw. And so while in New York City, Thayer decided to submit Green's name for attendance and entrance into West Point. Green will begin on June the 24th, 1819, entering the West Point Academy at just 18 years old. Several years later, he will graduate second in his class of 79 candidates with high honors and will receive a commission in the 3rd Regiment of Artillery. But Green didn't want field service right away. He preferred the teaching of artillery and the teaching of artillery tactics. And so he was very quickly appointed to assistant professorship at West Point uh, in the field of mathematics. After teaching there for several years, Green will be shipped down to Fort Monroe. He'll, he'll do a short stint teaching there as well. But finally, after several years of teaching, Green is going to be ordered to join his original regiment and serve with them out in the field at various uh, posts throughout New England over the next five years. It was during this time that Green met the love of his life, Mary Elizabeth Vinton, who was a sister of a West Point candidate that had graduated just one year ahead of Green. Uh, they they uh, get married, they begin to start a family, and just four years later, after marrying and beginning their family, Green is going to be sent to Fort Sullivan in the state of Maine. And between 1832 and 1833, over a seven-month period, Green's wife and all three children will pass away. You can imagine the devastating impact that this had on George Sears Green. The outgoing officer 
retreats within himself, and he finds solace in education. He starts reading as many books as he can get his hands on in the field of law and medicine. William Fox would later write about Green. He said, quote, during the next three years, he read exhaustive course in law and medicine, qualifying himself to pass examinations, admitting him to the practice in either of these professions. He also continued the studies in engineering, which he had pursued at all times since his graduation at West Point. So over the next several years, dealing with his grief, Green is reading and studying. Imagine being able to self and independently teach yourself the fields of medicine, law, and engineering, and be able to pass the required examinations to enter all those fields. He's incredibly brilliant. But just two years later, Green has had enough with the old army. Poor pay over his 13-year career and very slow promotion, which was not unusual in the old United States Army before the Civil War, led him to resign his commission. And for the next 20 years, Green would work on various railroads. In 1837, four years after the passing of his first wife and family, Green would fall in love again with Martha Barrett Dana, a uh, daughter of a U.S. congressman, Samuel Dana. Together they would have six children, one who would perish in inf infancy. But three of his sons would go on to serve in the Civil War. One important note is Dana Green, who was the executive officer on the Monitor, during the famous Monitor and Merrimack fight. In 1856, Green was appointed engineer in charge at the Department of Water Supply for New York City. And I share this small detail of his career with you to just, again, emphasize what a brilliant mind he had and what an impact that Green had not only on the battle here at Gettysburg, but on American history as well. One of the projects that he worked on during his time in this position with the Department of Water Supply in New York City was constructing the reservoir in Central Park that you can still see today. That reservoir would supply water to New York City until 1991, 140 years of service. Green also supervised enlargement of High Bridge in the Bronx, which still stands today. When the war breaks out in 1861, however, Green is going to volunteer his services, despite his age. The volunteer services in 1861 takes a couple months for the paperwork to get pushed through, but finally in January of 1862, he'll receive command as colonel of the 60th New York Infantry. At this time, he's 60 years old. He has five children, ages 10 to 13, and within a matter of months, by April of 62, he's promoted to brigadier general. He's been service in the Civil War Army for nearly seven months before he sees his first combat at the Battle of Cedar Mountain. And just a month later, Green will take his first and only sick leave to recover from wounds he received at Antietam. He would rejoin his regiment in just three weeks. Flash forward a year later to 1863 in the Battle of Gettysburg. William Fox would describe Green's appearance and personality and command style as the Gettysburg campaign was getting underway. He would say, quote, General Green's personal appearance at this time was about 62 years old thick set, five feet ten inches high, of dark complexion, iron gray hair, full of gray beard and mustache, gruff in manner, and stern in appearance, but with all an excellent officer, and under a rough exterior possessing a kind heart. In the end, the men learned to love and respect him as much as in the beginning they feared him. And this was saying a good deal on the subject. He knew how to drill how to command, and in the hour of peril, how to care for his command. And the men respected him accordingly. On the evening of July 2nd, 1863, the hour of Green's brigade in peril will come to fruition. Now we've learned a little bit about Green, who this man was and his life leading up to the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. But who were the men under his command? Green's brigade during the, the Battle of Gettysburg will include five regiments, all from the state of New York. The 60th, 78th, 120, uh, excuse me, 102nd, 137th, and 149th New York. These men are mostly farmers and laborers. There are a number of Irish and German immigrants in these regiments, as well as Canadians, Englishmen, Frenchmen, and in the 78th New York, one Australian will serve. 
They've hailed from such places in the state of New York as Ogdensburg, New York City, Buffalo, Rochester, Utica, Binghamton, and many, many other locations. They've come to respect Green, they've come to understand him, and they will follow him and his orders, whatever they may be. Now, as the Battle of Gettysburg comes to a conclusion on the evening of July 1st, the Union forces west and north of town have been defeated. They are falling back through the town of Gettysburg itself. Uh, two major generals, Oliver Otis Howard and Winfield Scott Hancock, are beginning to prepare a defense on a position that Howard had selected earlier in the day as a plan B, a fallback position, Cemetery Hill. That position is going to continue to expand as more survivors of the fighting west and north of town arrive and more reinforcements arrive to the field uh, with each and every passing moment. And that position is going to expand to the northwest corner of Culp's Hill. Beginning over on Culp's Hill, we're going to see an artillery battery placed by Winfield Scott Hancock, uh, uh, artillerist from the state of Maine. And we begin to see the remnants of the Iron Brigade as well as uh, Lysander Cutler's brigade that had fought in the morning of July 1st uh, take position on the northwestern slope. And you can see, if you look towards the top left of the map, those units from Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, uh, and New York. Now, one of the things I do want to stress during this program, that I'm going to give a lot of credit to George Sears Green and what he does, holding his command together, entrenching his men, providing them with breastworks and headlongs, and we're going to get into all of that. But we can't neg negate the fact that Green is not the first person to build breastworks on Culp's Hill. It is the remnants of the Iron Brigade and Cutler's Brigade that will immediately start constructing these entrenchments, these breastworks, as they go into position around 5.30 p.m. Uh, on the afternoon, early evening of July 1st. Now, at the same time that the Iron Brigade and Cutler's Brigade are going in position, they're beginning to dig, pile up uh, stones, pile up logs, brush, fences, fence rails, whatever they can find. At the same point in time, Green's Brigade, or, as well as his division in the 12th Corps, have finally arrived to the very southern end of the Gettysburg battlefield at about 5 p.m. on a march that they had started earlier in the day from two, ta two taverns. Flash forward just 12 hours later, Green's brigade, as well as his division, John Geary's division, is on the march. They're moving from their position on the southern end of the field in the area of Little Round Top, and they are heading over to extend the line of the Union First Corps units on Culp's Hill. Green would later write in his official report that we took position at about 6 a.m. on the crest of a steep and rocky hill, being thrown back nearly at right angles with the line of the First Corps. Rock Creek running past our front at a distance of 200 to 400 yards. Our position in front were covered with a heavy growth of timber, free from undergrowth, with large ledges projecting above the surface. These rocks and trees offered good cover for marksmen. The surface was very steep on our left, diminishing to a gentle slope on our right. In all, Green's position that he will take throughout the morning hours of July 2nd will stretch less than a quarter of a mile, about 1,500 feet in all, and it will be manned by 1,424 New Yorkers, all under the command of Green himself. Now, upon their arrival to Culp's Hill and beginning to extend the line of the First Corps, General Geary, the division commander in which Green's brigade belongs to, is going to call a conference of all of the brigade commanders under his command. And there at this conference, Geary is going to toss out the question of the idea of his brigades digging in, building breastworks, entrenching, piling up stones, cordwood, logs, fence rails, uh, brush, sticks, you name it. So he calls all together the brigade commanders. I'm sure those brigade commanders brought several members of their staff with them. And they're at this meeting, and they're going around discussing the idea of constructing these breastworks. And several accounts from the meeting that morning will discuss how General Geary was opposed to the idea of breastworks. And so as he's going around the conference and asking the other officers there, Geary starts the conference. I don't think this is a good idea. Men will not fight out in the field again, shoulder to shoulder, two ranks deep, if they learn that they can start fighting behind these prepared positions. So I don't think this is a good idea. So as he starts asking the other officers under his command what they think, you think anybody's going to disagree with the commanding general of the division? What do you think? No, I think that's a bad idea too, sir. Until they finally get to Green. 
And several accounts from the meeting will talk about that Green will stand up for the idea of using breastworks. Captain Collins of the 149th New York, who would write the regimental history of the unit in the post-war era, said that General Green was credited with replying that the saving of life was far more consequence to him than any theories to breastworks, and that, as so far as his men were concerned, they would have them if they had the time to build them. Geary's notion of having his men build these breastworks was made known to the other officers at the meeting and Geary his, himself. And not long after that, orders filter down amongst the New York regiments and Green's brigade, as Colonel Lewis Stegman of the 102nd New York will remember, while thus resting, an order came to build breastworks. And it is said that General Geary objected to it, but General Green persisted. Now you can imagine these guys, you know, they've been on the march for the last month of June. Uh, they've arrived to the area of Little Round Top the night before. They probably haven't been sleeping great, have not been eating well. They're getting up the crack of dawn on the morning of July 2nd. They've just got to Culp's Hill. They've just gotten to position and they've just sat down. And now your commanding officer is saying, all right, guys, well, let's get out the picks and shovels and, and the tin cups and the plates and the bayonets and let's start digging. I know if I was in that state, I would not be too happy with those orders. I'd like a moment to rest. And Captain Collins of the 149th New York said the men under his command grumbled a little bit when they received the orders and said it was the old trade of building works never to be used. But nevertheless, they brought sticks, stones, clunks and chunks of wood and felled trees and shoveled dirt for three or four hours. Now, where is... They, where's the brigade getting all of their materials? I would imagine everybody in this room has probably been on Culp's Hill. And you can readily see when you get up there that everything they're going to need is readily on hand. Captain Jesse Jones of the 60th New York said Culp's Hill was covered with wood, so all the materials were at our disposable. Uh, right and left, the men felled trees, and they blocked them into a close rail fence. Piles of cordwood, which lay nearby, were quickly appropriated. The sticks set slanting on end against the outer face of the logs made excellent battening. All along the line, the rest of the line of the Corps uh, constructed a similar defense. Fortunate regiments, which had spades and picks, strengthened their works with earth. So in addition to digging into the ground, blocking up these cordwood, bringing in stones, throwing up earth, one of the things that Green is also going to have added to this position are what is known as head logs. So there is a space in which the soldiers can put their rifles under the log, but it protects the body or the head. So Green is going to order that uh, to be constructed along these lines as well. Now, as I mentioned a little earlier in the program, I don't want you to walk away thinking Green originated the idea of breastworks here on the Gettysburg battlefield, um, and that General Geary was entirely opposed to it, um, and that, that Green should be given all the credit. We know that the Iron Brigade and Cutler's Brigade had started constructing earthworks the night before. Uh, we also know that when Geary talks to uh, his brigade commanders and, and Green objects to it, is that this is not the first time Green has had his men construct earthworks. What's often forgotten in this narrative is on the night of May 1st, during the Battle of Chancellorsville, Green is going to order a space of about 200 feet wide in front of his position on, uh, on the Chancellorsville, uh, Chancellorsville battlefield to be completely cleared of all obstructions. And then he's going to have the trees in that area felled with branches protruding out towards the enemy. In addition to this, works, uh, logs, and tree trunks would be stacked behind Abba T. And since few men in Green's Brigade at Chancellorsville had entrenching tools, the trenches were dug either with bayonets or tin plates. So Green's men have experience in doing this. So although that, that narrative is that, that Green is the sole progenitor of the breastworks on Culp's Hill, and this was the first time his men had done this in combat, they have experience with it. So after the next several hours, by noon on July 2nd, Green's position is completely constructed. The entrenchments are built, the logs are stacked, all of that work is done. But around 12 o'clock, uh, Green is going to send an order out uh, to members of the 137th New York, who are on the far right of his line, to construct one more portion of the line, known as a traverse. 
Now, a traverse is an entrenchment or an earthwork that is perpendicular to the main line of battle. This is a fallback position. If the enemy gets on your flank or in your rear, you can fall back to this perpendicular line and face the new threat head on and still be able to use this line of, of earthworks. Uh, today, in the 21st century, over the last 160 years, there's been a lot of controversy about who built them, if it was green that ordered them. Um, it may have simply just been an extension of some other earthworks that the brigade uh, next to green, to the right of his position, had built. But suffice it to say, these perpendicular works, this traverse, have been constructed, and they will be uh, very crucial to the story we're going to hear in just several moments. So by the 12 o'clock hour, Green's men are done. He's having members uh, of the 137th build this, this traverse, and he begins to send out skirmishers out towards his position. Green had received the orders from his division commander to advance uh, some hand-picked men for the skirmish duty to go uh, down Culp's Hill, across Rock Creek, and, and act as that advance warning system, if you will, uh, for any movements that may come their direction from the Confederate Army. Green is going to order about 170 men total under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John Reddington. And we're going to hear Reddington's account of that experience on the skirmish line. But suffice it to say, between the 12 o'clock hour and 1 p.m. on July 2nd, Culp's Hill is going to be defended by about 8,600 federal soldiers, uh, firmly positioned by a solid line of breastworks. Now, the next part of the story, we don't have time to get in too deeply. But suffice it to say, there's a very confusing story of who is in command of the Union Army's 12th Corps, who's giving orders to who, uh, and all of this confusion is going to play out on the late afternoon and early evening of July 2nd, as the main Confederate attack under James Longstreet has been launched off the Confederate right uh, towards the left end of the Union line. As places such as Little Round Top and Devil's Den and the Wheat Field and the Peach Orchard come under attack, General George Gordon Meade, in command of the Union Army, pictured in the top right of your screen there, uh, is looking for all and any available reinforcements to send to the left end of the Union line that's currently imperiled. And Meade is going to filter down through the chain of command, uh, eventually reaching the 12th Corps, to pack up and leave Culp's Hill in its entirety and to send those units southwards towards the Union Army's left flank to shore it up. This confusion in the command structure between uh, Major General uh, Henry W. Slocum, pictured on the left of your screen, a division officer now acting as a corps commander in this confusing command situation, a man by the name of Alpheus Williams, and division commander Brigadier General John Geary uh, is eventually going to play out that John Geary, around 7 p.m. on July 2nd, is going to receive orders to leave Culp's Hill. His division at this point in time is the last 12th Corps division on the hill. All the others have already been shipped southward towards the scene of the Union Army's left flank. So Geary would later write in his official report that about 7 p.m. he receives orders um, from Slocum himself telling him that he's got to go, that he's got to leave Culp's Hill, he has to go down to the Union left, and that he is instructed to leave just one brigade behind. And the brigade that Geary is going to select to leave behind on Culp's Hill is going to be that of General Green's brigade. 8,600 federal troopers are defending Culp's Hill at around noon, one o'clock on July 2nd. And now Green's brigade, 1,400 men, are gonna be tasked with filling up the rest of that space. So by 7 p.m., word reaches Green that he's gonna be left, and he's gonna have to occupy all of this space. And if you look on the map, and you look uh, towards the center of it, you'll see the, the name Candy up there. Everything from Candy making its way down to where Kane is, and you see the word Spangler Spring in the bottom of Doodle, all those soldiers from these 12th Corps units are being sent to the left. That's going to leave Green to fill all of these vacated positions with just his 1,400 officers and men. As Green is having his line stretch to fill um, all of this vacated breastworks and entrenchments, his line is going to be even further reduced because out on the skirmish line that you can see in the distance up by Rock Creek, 
Lieutenant Colonel John Reddington is asking for additional reinforcements. The Confederate attack has started to go forward. They're coming in contact with Confederate skirmishers. The skirmish line is beginning to heat up. The fighting is beginning to heat up, and he needs help. And so now, Green is going to take from the left of his line, not depicted on this map, but on the left of his line, he's going to order the 78th New York to make their way in the rear of the line and push through in the area where you see the, the 60th New York and 149th New York on the map and head on out to the skirmish line itself. As the 78th leaves, many men in Green's command will later write home and talk about just how thin their lines were. And the reason I emphasize this is because during this fight that we're about to describe, these men are not shoulder to shoulder, two ranks deep. There's a lot of space, and they're not two ranks deep in between. It's one guy on the line. A soldier in the 60th New York would write home on July the 6th. He said, our regiment was extended into one thin line. The men were two feet apart. We had the work of three regiments to do, and we did it. Inspired by the necessity and the importance of the moment, every man multiplied himself. Every man worked as if he knew his own life depended on his effort. A soldier in the 102nd New York, towards the center of Green's line, said to cover this distance, shifting his men right to fill all these breastworks, to cover this distance there was a very thin line, the men being fully a foot apart and in single rank. Now, we don't have time to get into the setup of the Confederate attack and why they're coming towards Culp's Hill and, and, and all the details behind that. Uh, but what we do have time for is to let you know that about 7, 7.30 p.m. on the evening of July 2nd, a division of Confederate soldiers under the command of Major General Edward Johnson, Allegheny Johnson, has been ordered forward by his Corps Commander Richard Stoddart Ewell. They have been waiting for these orders all day. The orders have finally come in. And throughout the day, as they've been waiting for him, they've been hearing the sounds of digging and felling of trees. Um, Johnson is going to go in, however, handicapped. He only has three of his brigades for them. There's this persistent rumor of Union soldiers getting on the left side of the Confederate Army, east of town. And so Johnson's going to be forced to make an assault with only three brigades uh, under the command of Brigadier General John Jones, commanding all Virginians, Colonel Jesse Williams, all Louisiana Brigade, and Brigadier General George Stewart's mixed brigade of Marylanders, North Carolinians, and Virginians. The famed Stonewall Brigade will be left behind in this duty of protecting the far left flank of the Confederate Army. By about 7.30 p.m., the skirmishers from these Confederate units finally make contact. Sergeant Martin L. Olmsted, pictured there on the left-hand side of your screen, recalled the moment. He said, as soon as the advanced skirmish line came within reach of us, we opened a brisk fire upon it. And the two lines of deployed men were soon battered into one blazing line of musketry. The smoke of the battle gathering under the dense foliage of the trees, together with the darkness of the evening, soon brought out to view the flashes of the musketry. And so near us came the solid line of battle at one time that its tramp, tramp, and the sharp, short commands of its officers became clearly audible. There's no way that Reddington is going to be able to hold his position much longer. And he gives the order for the skirmish line to fall back. As they're falling back, Reddington is telling to men, fall back two or three feet, two or three yards, turn around and fire. They're contesting every inch of ground as the skirmish line is making its way up the slope of Culp's Hill. Now, I can't emphasize this enough. Imagine that terrain, and I'm assuming all of you have seen it. If you haven't, it's worth getting out there. It is rugged terrain, it is steep terrain, and it is not easy climbing today with our modern shoes and boots and walking sticks and fresh water and air-conditioned vehicles at the end of the hike. Now do it with 40 pounds of gear on in darkness. As the skirmishers are hurrying back towards Green's main line, you can imagine what they're thinking. Please don't confuse us for the Confederates. I hope the men on the main line will hold their fire. Captain George Collins in the 149th New York towards the center of Green's line talks about it was, that it was all the officers could do in Green's regiments to keep the men from opening fire on the skirmish line. 
Colin, standing there in the breastworks, later wrote that the Confederates, they came running back, the skirmish line came running back, followed by a Confederate line of battle, yelping and howling in its peculiar manner. Some of the skirmishers were killed in sight of the brigade, and occasionally a stray bullet came whizzing by the heads of the men in the rifle pits, who were so eager and clamorous that it was all the officers could do to prevent them from opening fire before the men in the skirmish line could come in. The skirmishers, seeing their danger, cried out in agonizing and beseeching manners. The Confederate attack has reached Green's line, and as it begins to develop, Green immediately realizes there's no way his 1,400 men are going to be able to defend this massive position, a line that has doubled since earlier in the day without help. He'll quickly send aides on his staff uh, to Generals uh, Howard in command of the Union Army's 11th Corps and division commander in the 1st Corps, James Wadsworth, for help. Wadsworth's command are to the left of Green's line. These are the men in the Iron Brigade and Cutler's Brigade. They're the closest to be able to help Green. And there's no Confederates moving on their position. And when the aide gets to Wadsworth and says, Green is requesting help, he's coming under attack, can you send some of your men, can you send some of your units from the left side over here to help Green? Wadsworth says, hey, listen, I don't know if the Confederates are coming my way, so I'm not sending any of my men to the assistance of Green. They'll be here, and they'll be on the ready. But at this point in time, you're going to have to tell the general he's on his own. In addition, it's going to take a while for Green's staff to find General Howard to get reinforcements of the 11th Corps moving over to Culp's Hill. Green is going to go into this defense by himself. Now, the first brigade to reach Green's line, and there is some historical debate, but it's going to be the far right end of the Confederate attack on division, uh, uh, on the right of the Confederate division, on Johnson's division, is going to be that brigade of Virginians under the command of, of, George, uh, of John Jones. Now, Jones's brigade is going to try to maintain their formation. Again, it's dark. You can see the terrain. It's rugged. It's steep. It's almost impossible to maintain that shoulder-to-shoulder, two-man rank formation as they push up the slope. And by the way, Jones's men are going to be pushing up towards the, the most steep and stoutest part of Green's defenses on the left of his line. They are going to make it to within 75 yards of Green's position before the left end of Green's line opens fire. Captain Steuben Kuhn of the 60th New York recalled the arrival of Jones' Virginians and the orders to wait to fire. He said not a shot was fired at them until they got within 15 rods. Then the order was given to fire, and we did fire and kept firing. If ever men loaded and fired more rapidly than the 60th did on that occasion, I never saw them do it. These rebels yelled like wild Indians and charged upon us on the double quick. They acted bravely. They came as close as they could, but very few got within two rods of us. Those that did never went away again. We gave them a welcome with leaden bullets that sent many a brave rebel, for they are brave, to his last account. The fighting on the left end of Green's line near the 60th New York uh, against these Virginians is going to occur over the next two hours as the Virginians continually try to break Green's line. I don't want you to imagine that the Virginians get to 75 yards and they stand there and trade fire back and forth. The 60th New Yorkers and the other New Yorkers in Green's brigade are going to break that assault. These Confederates, both in Jones's brigade as well as the Louisianans, are going to fall back down the hill, they're going to reform, and they're going to try it again. So over the next about two hours of fighting, these Confederate troops, these brigades, are going to launch anywhere from three to four separate assaults on Green's position. After about two hours of sustained combat, the fighting on the front of the 60th New York and the left of Green's line has slackened. And Abel Goddard, the colonel of the 60th, uh, will talk about what he ordered his men to do next. He said, I ordered an advance uh, of a portion of the regiment who eagerly leaped over the works and surrounded about 50 of the enemy, among whom were two officers and took at the time two flags, one a brigade color and the other a regimental banner. At the receipt of these flags, a quiet enthusiasm pervaded the men and officers of the regiment. Several historians will place 
Jones's brigade is anywhere from getting 10 paces, or excuse me, 30 paces to 300 yards uh, from Green's line. Those three to four separate attacks will not break Green's position. Now, at the same time this is happening, as we travel further down Green's line towards its center, a brigade of Louisiana soldiers under the command of Jesse Williams has begun his assault on Green's position. And again, there's some historical debate whether the Virginians slammed into Green's line first or the Louisianans. But it's relatively close as to when Green's line comes under attack both on its left and its center. Williams, like Jones, is going to get within about 100 yards of Green's position before he uh, orders the Louisianans to fire. And from that position, about 100 yards from Green's front, is going to be the baseline for the Louisianans. That each time that their assault is broken, they fall back to that 100-yard lines away, they reform, and they try it again, over and over and over again. Colonel Louis Stegman in the 102nd New York, walking amongst his men, holding them steady with each and every subsequent attack, said four times with desperate yells and with the determination to carry these works at all hazards had the Confederates charged. And four times they went back discomfited. They had charged clear to the work so close that they made attempts to grasp our regimental flag and they died as their hand clutched our colors. They built breastworks of their own dead on their brigade front. So merciless was the Union fire, and the men who so used their comrades' bodies were killed behind them. Now, there are very few Union accounts and only two accounts of the Louisianans that I've been able to find in my research on this that say that the Louisianans actually broke Green's line in the front of the 102nd New York. One of those accounts comes to us from a captain by the name of Nathan Rollins of the 14th Louisiana. He said, three times we charged the breastworks and re were repulsed, but the fourth time we succeeded uh, after a heroic struggle and the loss of many men. He'll say that I was shot in the leg and he bayoneted in the left breast. To provide some evidence that at least the Louisianans got to the works and perhaps broke through, the flag of the 14th Louisiana after the battle was counted to have nearly 200 bullet holes, one shell hole, and one shell fragment that had perforated the flag during the battle. But here too, by 10 p.m., this attack has petered out, and they've not been able to break Green's lines. Captain Nathan Rollins, that, that member of the 14th Louisiana that said that they had broken through that portion of Green's position, talked about his wound to the left leg and the left breast. He, he doesn't recall how they got him out of the breastworks. He remembers waking up in the woods the next morning and seeing a regimental physician uh, treating both his wounds and the wounds of those around him. And of the attack that had happened the previous night, and I think it's such a great quote, he later commented, the young folks of today don't know anything about hard times. <laughs> Very apropos, even to 2023. The last part of the Confederate attack on Green's line is going to come from George Stewart's brigade. This is a mixed brigade of men from Maryland, North Carolina, and Virginia. They had the farthest to go to get online to attack Green's position, and they had some of the worst terrain to get across. Um, but when they finally do, the right side of, of Stewart's assault, which you can see here towards the right center of your screen, the 3rd North Carolina and the 1st Maryland Battalion, are the first ones to get there. George Collins uh, would write his wife Kate just seven days later, and he said when the fight commenced on us, it was furious and lasted until we had fired about 80 rounds of cartridges. It was hellish enough and made me sick. The attack of the Confederates and the 1st Maryland Battalion and uh, the 3rd North Carolina Regiment was violent and vicious. At the end of the engagement, in front of the works of the 149th New York, eight Confederates were found dead in one spot, only eight feet square. These men were all from one company and were killed all at the same time. So Stewart's brigade has had some challenges to get online. The brigade has split. The right half has attacked first. And as they are attacking the front of Green's position, Green's line that had been extended on the evacuation of the rest of the 12th Corps with the 137th New York starts to fire into the left flank of the men from Maryland and North Carolina. It is devastating on the attackers. 
so much so that their commanding officers are telling the Confederates to lie down on the ground to load and fire from your bellies. William Goldsboro, pictured here on the left of your screen, wrote at this moment at the battle that men fell like autumn leaves, but the brave fellows disdained to retreat. As this fighting is occurring, the rest of Stuart's brigade finally arrives, men from the 37th, 23rd, and 10th Virginia. And as they close in on Green's position, uh, the 10th Virginia realizes that these works that have been constructed earlier in the day by Kane's brigade and Geary's division were abandoned, and that the right flank of the 137th New York was completely exposed. Orders come down from Stuart to have the 10th, supported by the 23rd, charge into this position. As the Confederate attack gets underway, the commanding officer of the 137th New York, Colonel David Ireland, realizes he is receiving fire on his flank and rear. So just like that other guy at that other hill on the far end of the Union line <laughs> does, Ireland is going to order his men to refuse the line itself and face this new threat. They're going to fight there in, in these entrenchments that have been constructed by Kane's men for only about 30 minutes before the weight of this Confederate assault is too much. And Ireland is going to order these men to fall back to that traverse that had been constructed about eight hours earlier. It is a very complicated movement. The orders are disseminated, and the men start falling back. This happens so quickly, however, that Green, or excuse me, Ireland with the 137th New York is unable to let the colonel of his, his regiment, neighbor's regiment to the left, excuse me, the 149th New York, of what he is doing. And they see the 137th running across towards the rear, and they think, my God, we're retreating. And they start going. And the officers are running behind them. No, stop, come back. And it takes a few minutes to get the 149th back in action. Meanwhile, a captain in the 137th New York, uh, a man by the name of Joseph H. Gregg, volunteers to take a squad of men from the 137th, hop over the works of the Traverse, and charge headlong into the assault of these several Confederate regiments from Virginia. Gregg, at the head of his men, leading him in this assault, a bayonet charge no less, would fall mortally wounded in the endeavor. But by 11 p.m. on the evening of July 2nd, Green's line has held. The Confederates will settle in to a night on the hill. Now, the losses for Green's brigade are quite minimal, and it shows the efficacy of the breastworks that have been constructed. Out of those 1,400 officers and men that Green had put into that position, he would only lose about 21% of his command. Uh, couple that, however, with the losses uh, in these three Confederate brigades, which are far more higher. Jesse Jones in the 60th New York would later say, had the breastworks not been built and there had only been the thin line of our unprotected brigade, that line must have been swept away like leaves before the wind by the on oncoming of so heavy a mass of troops and the Baltimore Pike would have been reached by the enemy. As I mentioned, by 11 p.m., Green's line is being pulled out. More units have finally arrived to support him. Those units are going to take positions in Green's works as his units will rest over the coming evening, and the fight will continue early the following morning. Now, before we close the program today, I want to talk about several of the officers reflecting on this moment. The New Yorkers had sustained four charges. They had repelled them all, and Green's force is still intact as a fighting force. Green will point out that the officers and men had behaved admirably during the whole of the contest, where all so well had did their duty. It is difficult to specially commend any individual, but all have my heart's commendations for their gallant conduct and for the good service rendered their country. I encourage you to go out to Culp's Hill to see where this story happened. Just two years ago, the Gettysburg Foundation and Gettysburg National Military Park uh, joined together with several other partners and philanthropists to restore an 18-acre track of ground in front of Green's Line so you can see what those conditions were like on the evening of July 2nd, 1863. And before I leave you, I want to leave you with this. Dan Sickles, on that Friday in September of 1907, at the dedication of the monument to George Sears Green, challenged everyone in attendance 
and future generations to remember the importance of George Green, his New York soldiers, and the victory at Culp's Hill and of the Battle of Gettysburg. Sickles would say, quote, these who are now present, you, Remind this generation of the debt it owes to the soldiers who won the victory for the Union, not only for themselves, but for the millions who enjoy the fruits of the triumph gained at the cost of so many thousands of lives. Thank you. Before you leave, let me remind you that the program will begin again at 1.30 in the Ford Room. Some of Dan's public, published work, if you're interested, has been signed and is available for sale in the Visitor Center. He will be circulating around, not sitting behind a table. But if you track him down and ask him to sign it, I bet he will. Thank you for being part of the Sacred Trust, a program sponsored by the Foundation and the National Park Service. And we hope to see you again a little bit later. If you're not already a member of the foundation, now is a great time to go in and sign up at the Friends Desk.